Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly for February 22nd, 2020. It's the time of year, week, when we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord in your web browser. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. If the meeting time is changed, we uh, note it on our online calendar and also mention it on Discord. If you'd like to be notified about changes to the meeting, we can add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. And as I mentioned, there's an online calendar, which is kind of the number one source of truth about when the meeting is. This meeting is recorded. We record audio from the voice channel and video of the text channel. If you would rather not have your voice recorded, uh, you're still welcome to participate via text. Uh, the video of this meeting will be posted to YouTube and later released as a podcast on various podcast services. If it's not available on your favorite service, please let us know. There is a notes document to accompany this meeting and recording. If you're watching us on YouTube, it's down there in the notes. If you wish to participate but can't make it to the meeting, leave your hug reports and status updates in the document and we'll read them off. The notes document will also contain timestamps to go along with the video, so you can skip to the parts that interest you the most. This meeting tends to run 30 to 60 minutes, so it gives you the option to skip around. And uh, also on Discord, the Notes document for the upcoming meeting is always in the pinned messages in the CircuitPython channel, so click up on the push pin to find the link. The meeting is held in five parts. The first is community news, where we take a look at uh, CircuitPython and Python on hardware news from the community. It is a preview of the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to. The third part, and the first one where y'all get to participate, is Hug Reports, an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing and take the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. Fourth is Status Updates, an opportunity to sync up on what we've been doing over the last week and what we hope to do in the next week or so until the next meeting. Uh, and then finally, In the Weeds, which is an opportunity for more long-form discussions, and we invite participation from anybody who has a viewpoint to share about these items. And that covers how the meeting will go. So next, I am going to take my first timestamp and start community news, uh, which I seem to have lost the header for. That's fun. All right. So, community news. Python turned 30 on February 20th, and we've got some links to that in the text chat. Uh, we've also got another number milestone, but I'm going to let Katni give it to us during the um, State of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Scott posted the long-awaited CircuitPython 2021 roundup. A large number of members in the community uh, talked about what they wanted to do with CircuitPython in 2021 and what we need to do to get there, and there is a link to each one of those over on the Adafruit blog. Next, I picked a couple of projects that the community has been doing. Uh, so first, Cat Outside is a reminder with CircuitPython and an Adafruit MagTag e-ink display. We've got a link to Twitter. Check it out. Although I think that the outcat should be facing away and there should be the, never mind, uh, on the other end. Next, uh, putting CircuitPython on a custom SAMD21 powered USB-C plug tester, also from Twitter. And more Twitter, a hacking prank with a Pico using the Raspberry Pi Pico. Those kids are having fun and it's not hurting anybody. And uh, finally, for this section of the meeting, but not for the newsletter, uh, a CircuitPython class to drive the LEDs and read the buttons on a Pimeroni RGB keyboard with the Raspberry Pi Pico. Links to Twitter and GitHub for the source code. The CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter is a community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are on adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. We like to highlight the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. 
Uh, so, community, you are the drivers on this, so we invite you to edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request. Or you can also tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. And that brings us to the second section, the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. I will read the overall and then turn it over to some of the other folks to talk about the other sections. So overall, we had 37 pull requests merged from 22 authors during the last week. So uh, some good names there. Uh, I don't recognize uh, KTI Bo, but I think maybe they've had a couple of contributions lately. Luke Schwab, G. Pongeli, Sandy J. McDonnell, I. M. Grant, Oli Mickles. Um, so yeah, we are always happy to see new authors um, making the community more and more vibrant. On the reviewers front, we've got uh, people who've kind of become the usual suspects, nine reviewers. Uh, but, you know, I always wanted to thank people who are um, working outside of, uh, outside of Adafruit. So uh, Foamy Guy and S. Patrick W., I'm particularly happy to see you putting in reviews. Reviews are part of making the whole pull request process work because we want to have at least a second set of eyes on every change. So uh, if you want to work up to being an official reviewer, uh, you can comment on pull requests, you can let us know that you tested something, that you looked the code over for problems. If you found problems, uh, let us know, always in a respectful way to the uh, submitter to the, of the PR and other people. But uh, we love to see participation and it helps us increase what CircuitPython can do. On the issues front, we had 26 issues closed by 13 people and 18 open by 14 people. So uh, the first thing to note is that we had a net decrease in issues over the last week, which is always good, and that we had over a dozen people participating both to open and close issues. So uh, quality um, activity by the community. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Scott if he wants to tell us about the core. Sure. You can hear me, right? Yeah. All right. So for the core, uh, we had four pull requests merged from three different authors. Uh, thank you to our authors. We had two reviewers. We have 23 open pull requests, which is a number that's growing a bit. So it looks like at least, yeah, five of those are open with zero days. So we're getting lots of new stuff in, which is great. Um, again, if you're uh, working on any of these older PRs, please, uh, or if you think you might have open PRs, please take a look and make sure that there's a plan going forward with them. If there's not, uh, go ahead and close them. You can always reopen them later. Um, or open a new PR. So uh, we don't generally like to have things lingering. So uh, if you could take a look at that, uh, that would be awesome. Issues wise, we had eight closed issues by three people and six open by four people. So we're net down two, which is great. For a total of 401 open issues. Um, this number is growing. It's uh, not something to be super concerned about. Um, we do have a category called long term. Uh, where like we think these are great ideas, but we don't intend on doing them immediately, and like that, that category should be the one, the only one that grows. Um, hopefully, what we're doing is we're going through the other stuff. Uh, we have some six point X related milestones. It looks like there's about uh, 55, 57 issues there total. So we should take a look at those as well. Um, but nothing super concerning. We're you know we're we're slowly growing, but slowly growing is fine. Um, it's, I think, pull requests is generally where we want to make sure that we don't grow at all. Um, so that's where we are with issues. We don't have any issues that are not assigned to milestone, so it looks like we're up to date in terms of triage. Uh, overall, 620, 620 is going pretty well. Um, I think we'll keep doing betas until we're ready to do a stable release, and then probably uh, switch gears after 6.2 into a 7.0 kind of mindset. Um, so keep an eye on that. Please, uh, please uh, keep testing everything, and uh, should be really good. Thank you, Scott. And next, uh, once she finishes taking notes for us, I will hand it over to Katni to tell us about the libraries. And thank you, Katni, for taking notes today. You're very welcome, Jeff. All right. Uh, so this is about all of the Adafruit Circuit Python libraries, and uh, a few other extras such as the Circuit Python Community Bundle. Um, we had 29 pull requests merged from 19 different authors, including a few of the names uh, Jeff read off earlier. 
um, I noticed that in some of those merged requests, we had one that was 57 days old and one that was 21 days old, which is great. It's always good to see that we are keeping up with the older ones, but many, many, many of those were new, so it's also excellent to see all of the recent uh, contributions. We had uh, 19 authors, I believe I said that, and eight reviewers, leaving us with 50 open pull requests. Uh, we had 17 issues closed by 11 people and 10 open by eight people, so we are net down uh, for 284 open issues. There are seven good first issues um, that is a label that goes on issues that are excellent if you are new to contributing um, to Git or GitHub, new to contributing to CircuitPython, uh, they're a great place to start. If you're interested in contributing to the Python side of CircuitPython, uh, consider going to circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, um, including a list of open pull requests, a list of open issues, and some library infrastructure issues, as well as uh, how to contribute to translating uh, the circuit, circuit Python core. Um, the list of issues, you can search by label. So if you're new to things, good first issue is a good place to start. If you want something a little more complicated, bug or enhancement are both good. Um, and we have a guide on contributing to Git and GitHub, or contributing to Circuit Python rather using Git and GitHub. Um, and we're always available on Discord to answer questions. So don't let that part of things uh, intimidate you. We want to make sure that you help in whatever way makes the most sense for you. Um, reviewing things, you can basically just take a look at it, leave a comment, let us know you took a look at it. Uh, any reviewing helps. And also, if you have been doing that for a while and you want to level up to actual reviewer, let us know. Um, we can walk you through what that involves. And um, the more reviewers we have, the more authors we can support. So we're always looking for more reviewers, um, both on the core with you know, the 23 open pull requests there and with the libraries having 50 open pull requests, um, having more reviewers is always an excellent way for us to keep up with that a little bit better. Um, and we had one new library this week, um, the SSD 1681. And I believe we had two new community bundle libraries as well, um, which it occurs to me perhaps I should get listed um, in this data and a number of updated libraries that I won't read off. And that's where we are with the libraries. Very nice. Thank you, Katni. And with that, I will hand it to Maker Melissa with the Blinka stats. Hello. With uh, Blinka, which is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for Raspberry Pi and other single board computers this week, we had four pull requests merged by three authors and two reviewers. There are um, three open pull requests remaining, and there was one closed issue by one person and two open by two people, leaving a net of 52 open issues. Uh, there are, were 1,361 Pi PI downloads in the last week, and we currently are supporting 67 boards. And that's it. Thank you. Next section is Hug Reports. In Hug Reports, we invite you to take a few moments to tell us about what uh, the awesome people around us in the community are doing. Usually this is focused on Discord, but uh, people on Twitter and GitHub and all those other places are also fair game. Uh, I will start and then we will go down the line alphabetically with everyone who has uh, put their notes or placeholder in the document. So um, I would like to start off with a group hug and next thank uh, Scott for hosting me on his deep dive as well as everyone who we chatted with. I didn't actually go back and note down those names from the Discord chat, but uh, you know the, the community was as always very uh, positive and uh, had a lot of great questions for us to discuss. And I, I think we went for about 90 minutes. I was planning to be on for 60 and it was just fun to hang out with y'all and with Scott. Uh, to Zoltan V923Z for promptly responding to uh, ULAB items as usual. We kind of expect that, um, feeling a little bit spoiled, but um, yeah. And uh, to the PCB design channel folk, including Skur, for giving me compliments on a rather boring PCB design. But one of my goals for 2021 is to get a little more into the groove of designing PCBs, whether or not I actually order them and I shared up a design. And yeah. People are great, so appreciated that. And next, I will pass it to Jerry, and after that, I will have notes from uh, Jay Fursine. 
Uh, hello. Uh, just uh, thanks to, to Dan for getting the second CDC port working. It was always nice to have a new toy. All right. I have notes from a couple of people, and then I will hand it to Katni. Uh, Jay Fursine writes, uh, hug to Anecdata and Naradoc for helping debug a socket issue in the requests library, and to Geek Mom Projects for her LED art and CircuitPython talk at PyCascades. I saw the talk go by on Twitter and I haven't watched it yet. I'm not sure if the video is up yet, but definitely hope that I have a chance to see that because her projects, yeah, they are great. All right, next I have notes from uh, Jose David M, who is missing the meeting, who says thanks to Kmatch98 uh, for reviewing and keeping the conversation open. Conversation open. To uh, Microdev for implementing UART for the Pico. To Naradoc for always helping in Discord. It is inspiring to witness. And to Foamy Guy and Scott, thanks for the streams. It is important as a community builder tool. And uh, in the text chat, they are discussing that the videos will be up in a couple of days. So look for those videos from Pi Cascades. I, I think they're going to be a treat. Um, I have no doubt of that. And now I will hand it off to Katni. Thanks, Jeff. So, uh, spoiler alert um, for part of my status update, but I want to um, say thank you to everyone who's contributed to the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries and to the community bundle. We've passed 300 total CircuitPython uh, libraries available. I want to have a hug report to Hugo for working on, uh, to add Pilot to the pre-commit, to ask Patrick W for continued work on CircuitP. Uh, to Kmatch98 and Foamy Guy for continuing to work on the CircuitPython UI elements, and to Crayola for spending multiple days in the labyrinth that is JavaScript to help me with my website and for helping me with my new theme. Thank you. Um, let's see. Next is Kmatch98, and then after that is Maker Melissa. So go ahead. Yeah, thanks. So, first off, thanks to Katni, Jay, Forsen, and Hugo for guidance on Sphinx and its cryptic uh, statements. Uh, and how to, especially how to learn about uh, incorporating class inheritance. Still a lot to learn though. Uh, thanks to Foamy Guy for feedback on the widget and control classes, which are in PR right now. Uh, next, thanks to Jose, uh, who's J Posada 2020, for a quick uh, improvement on bitmap label, uh, particularly for how to adjust text and arrange it uh, cleanly. And in fact, I used it that same day that he uh, submitted a PR, so thanks for that. Uh, and Jeff, thanks to you. I uh, gave you a hug last week, but I uh, thought a little more about it, and without starting an arms race on hug levels, uh, no pun intended, uh, I thought to deserve more more hugs this week, that uh, your your work on adding the bitmap, bitmap font uh, to handle PCF fonts, not only is it faster, but you also thought through all the challenges of getting the font into the right format, and even gave a website to convert those fonts. Uh, so basically it's a good example of not just solving one one small issue, but everything that it takes to, to take advantage of it. So special thanks for you for sharing your skills to do that and uh, an example that we can all strive toward. Uh, and lastly, uh, Hugo, thanks for improvements in the progress bar and a special call out for your positive attitude. Thanks, thanks for all your work, thanks. Thanks, I'm blushing a little bit over here. Um, all right, uh, next we have Maker Melissa, then I'll read notes from Microdev, and after that, Naradoc. Go ahead, Melissa. Hello. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to give a hug report to Dan uh, H for your help with getting my system set up to compile CircuitPython. Uh, hug to Scott for the groundwork you laid on display IO e ink uh, displays, which made adding another one pretty easy. Uh, I wanted to give a hug to KMesh98 for your suggestion about adding rotation to matrix portal. Uh, one to you, Jeff, for reviewing some of my code. Uh, to ask Patrick W for your work on the cookie cutter templates and to Brent for writing the date time library and a group hug to everyone else. Thank you. From uh, Microdev, we have a group hug. Uh, so next is Naradoc, and after that, Entol. Oh, wait. Uh, okay, Naradoc is lurking. Uh, maybe it said that, and I overlooked it. All right. Uh, 
Nerdoc says group hug to the whole community for its warm welcome. And specifically, a hug for Ask Patrick W for more Circ Up goodness. Uh, to Dan H for the second CDC channel. And insights on why Mac Pi Serial incorrectly identifies the channels. And a belated hug report to Katni for welcoming me in the CircuitPython helper role. Uh, so we'll go to Entol and then to Tanut. Hi folks, hello from the UK. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to those uh, Circuit Pythonistas making thoughtful contributions to the discussion over uh, in the repo called the new editor about how we might make uh, the Circuit Python mode even more polished and useful for our wonderful users. That's it, and for everybody else. Thank you. It's a great project you've got here. <laughs> Thanks. It's nice to hear from you. It's been a little while. All right, I will hand it to Scott, and then I have some notes, and after that, we'll head back to the top of the alphabet. All right, uh, first off, the thank you to Zodius Infuser from Pimeroni for the board support PR that I'm excited to get to today. Uh, thank you to Jeffler for joining my stream. It's always nice to have a guest on. Uh, next, uh, another PR I'm looking forward to is from uh, June to SAC uh, for a PR for Deep Sleep on the NRF52. Uh, this is something that's definitely been on our radar, and it's cool to see it come in even before we expect it. Uh, hug report to Dan H for knocking out a few of our older, I oldest issues with the US secondary USB CDC. And then lastly, uh, in case folks don't know, uh, hug report to, to the folks over at JLink, who just did a stable release of the JLink software that includes RP2040 support. I plan on using that today. So those are all my hugs. Very nice. I've been using the Pico probe and it works really well, but I'm down to two Picos that aren't permanently embedded in projects, so I don't know how long that's going to be a workable solution. Uh, anyway, I think TG Techie is going to uh, talk next, so I will hand it to you and then head back to the top of the alphabet. So, yeah, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, I have a hug for Dan H, who helped me figure out a long standing issue configuration file for the smart-ish watch I've been working on, the PC one, um, and a community hug. And uh, to level up the community hug, community hug 3000. <laughs> All right, at the top of the alphabet, uh, we have notes from a few people. It looks like um, the next person who I won't be reading those for is Deshipu. But now we have Ask Patrick W, who has hug reports for me and for Katni for the PR reviews on CircUp. And hugs for Microdev and Ski East for picking up the update ESPIDF to 4.3 work and running with it. Next, we have uh, notes from Seagrover with hug reports for Tanut and Lady Ada for the encouragement to challenge my software development limitations and a group hug to the team and community. Oh, and I was incorrect as to who's next. It's you, Dan. Sorry about that. Hi, thanks. Um, uh, hug report to Neradoc or Neradoc in Discord, who's been doing a whole lot of helping people overcome the usual sorts of problems. It's very helpful to have multiple people who know how to fix things. And thanks to you, Jeff and uh, Zoltan, for quick fixes to, to uh, ULab to fix a bug that I originally thought was a BLE bug, but it turned out it just I was using ULab to compute uh, some microphone data, and it provoked a certain bug um, based on ULab, and that got fixed basically over the weekend, and is now incorporated, which is terrific. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll read some notes from David and then pass it to Dishapu. Uh, so David writes a hug report to Tanut for the CircuitPython 2021 Roundup and PWM. I'm not sure what PWM. Oh, I guess literally PWM. Uh, Dan H. for the second CDC serial. Oh, uh, PWM audio out on the Raspberry Pico. Uh, a hug report to me for the 8 NeoPixel thing with PIO and the book on binary hacks that I recommended in the stream and to Deshipu for the display I.O. Tetris. Uh, so next is Deshipu and then Fomigai.
Well, in case Deshipu isn't there, uh, Desh they have a group hug. Uh, I'll pass it to Foamy Guy and then uh, Hire Effect. And then we'll wrap it up with some notes that I'll read. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, hugs this week. Uh, anybody who has tuned in to my streams on Saturday mornings, uh, if you've caught them live or watched any of the videos up on YouTube, I've been having lots of fun with that and learned neat things from the folks who are watching. And that's kind of become one of the things I'm you know, acceptably looking forward to each week. So big thanks to anybody uh, who's checked that out. To um, Jose, uh, J put us the 2020 on GitHub for diving into an issue with uh, tab characters that were um, they're getting uh, basically ignored inside a display text label. Uh, and Jose uh, took a stab at tackling that. To Hugo for looking into uh, and starting up the PR on, on a cookie cutter for moving a pylint action inside a pre-commit. Um, and also uh, a couple, of, I'm a week or two late on this one, but uh, Hugo wrote up a really nice page that covers some helpful Git commands like uh, renaming branches and things like that that I was asking about, uh, and Hugo put that together. So big thanks for that as well. Um, and lastly to KMH98 uh, is always doing all sorts of great testing and has thoughtful uh, discussions and ideas and things on uh, many, many different IO some some mine, some others. I see see that uh, name K match go by a lot working on uh, on reviewing display IO stuff and I really appreciate that. So thank you there. All right. And just your uh, note for Hugo made me think we were talking earlier um, in the internal meeting about whether subdirectories of examples were being correctly pilented. And so, Kenny, you might want to check in on whether this change of when the pilot action occurs is going to affect that as you look at the problem. Um, totally random. Sorry to interrupt. I'm going to turn it over to Higher Effect for Hug Reports. Alrighty. Uh, thanks this past week to Dan for helping answer some low power questions as I work on that implementation. Um, thanks to Brent uh, for uh, his testing help on um, some last straggling uh, socket issues and a group hug to all. All right. And I will wrap it up reading the notes from Hugo, who has a work meeting at this time. What's really more important, Hugo? Anyway, uh, Hugo has a hug report for Katni for being trusting enough to let me take a crack at the pilot change in cookie cutter. To ask Patrick W and me for the input on the pilot in pre-commit change. To Foamy Guy and Kmatch98 for feedback and testing of the progress bar. And finally, to Kmatch98 for spurring thought and discussion on inheritance while working with Sphinx. And that wraps up Hug Reports and brings us to status updates. In status updates, we invite you to take a few moments to let us know what you've been up to in CircuitPython and beyond since the last time we had a chance to talk and what you hope to get up to in the next week or so. Um, again, it's in a round robin. Uh, works a lot like hug reports, but it's a little uh, drier. So I will start and then pass on to Jerry. So uh, last week, my biggest work was on uh, code and text for an upcoming guide with um, driving eight NeoPixels from the Raspberry Pi Pico with a shift register and code running on the PIO uh, IO processor. It was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Um, I also did various bug fixing that some people alluded to during hug reports, uh, particularly in Microlab. And um, I took a patch that I had made to implement a function called memoryview.cast, which is in standard Python and wasn't in CircuitPython. Dan helpfully merged that into the core, so if you need it, it's there now. And this morning, I looked at the problem on RP2040 with storage.erase file system, discovered that it has to do with low-level USB stuff. So I kicked it over to Tak, who is the author of Tiny USB to look at. Um, this week, this got a little bit reorganized in the meeting. So my number one is to work on a second guide of PIO plus CircuitPython, which will um, kind of look at some of the examples from the SDK, um, from the manual for the microcontroller itself, and from the examples repository. Where it makes sense, we'll adapt those into CircuitPython. 
um, explain it more more or less, try and give an overview of the PIO assembly language, all that good stuff. I'm not sure exactly how long that'll take, and it may come out in bits and pieces. Um, the NeoPO guide is finished, but I have a feeling it makes sense to just hold that until after the next beta so that people don't have to get an absolute latest to try out the code. And at some point I will get back to looking at this uh, protomatter bug that exists on RP2040 only and is related to accessing the USB drive, we think. And as for fun stuff, the temperature outside is above freezing. So uh, pretty soon after this meeting, I'm gonna go out and take a walk. And I've just been reminded that um, I was supposed to start with a mini in the weeds from Entol. So let me find the right spot in the document to drop that time code and I will hand it over to you. And I am sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no problem. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. So uh, thank yes. you very much, first of all, uh, for letting me um, interrupt, as it were, uh, and get things out, out of order. Sorry about that. Uh, I have a meeting immediately after this one. Um, so uh, uh, I really appreciate your flexibility. Um, so I'm involved with the Mew editor, and there's been a huge amount of work on Mew uh, during COVID lockdown in, here in the UK and in Western Europe, which is where most folks uh, working on Mew uh, are based. Um, but I just want to um, shout out uh, and recognize uh, contributions from uh, Frank Morton. I believe Frank is actually on the call. I can see some of the names uh, in the channel um, and others in the CircuitPython community who have uh, made uh, either pull requests or bug reports or suggestions about how the CircuitPython mode in Mu could be improved. Um, and it's become apparent uh, that rather than turning this into a, a, a terrible exercise in cat herding, wouldn't it be good if we just all got together, had a lovely cup of tea, sat down and had a chat about what we might want to do, uh, and then everybody's on the same page. Um, so if you uh, follow the link that's been posted, thank you Foamy Guy, in the, uh, in, in the chat, uh, you'll see that I've uh, summarized basically where we are. I'll drop a doodle poll. Uh, into that uh, PR chat uh, so people can tell me exactly how all the time zones conflict um, and we'll try and work out the, uh, the, the best time when we can uh, get together and have a chat and figure out what our story is uh, for uh, improvements to the circuit Python mode because uh, we hope to make a new version of Mu released very soon. Lots of lovely shiny things coming on that. Thank you very much. That's it from me. Thank you. Um, I'm not a user of Mew myself, but uh, you know when you see it in all of our guides, uh, you know that it's very important to how we see people entering the community interacting with their CircuitPython boards. So uh, I appreciate that you're engaging with us on that, and I hope uh, great things come out of it. Me too, me too, and thank you for the opportunity. All right. So getting back to the flow of things. Uh, now I will hand it over to Jerry and then I have some notes to read. Okay, uh, let's see. So spent a bunch of time playing with the, with the new CDC stuff. Uh, tried out a bunch of different boards. The um, NR52 and the Pico and the NR40 Grand Central. And it's been, been fun to play with. Now I've got to figure out a, what to do with it. But um, and otherwise, the week was spent with just lots of unfocused uh, explorations of various things, like I usually end up doing, and probably do a little lot more of that next week. I have no idea what I'm going to be doing next. Um, but I am working on getting my bird cam back out for deployment. Had a great success last year with it. Got a, a, a Y0W with a camera built into a birdhouse. That uh, last year we got two nests in and got to watch the eggs hatch and the chicks grow up and fledge. That was really a lot of fun. But this year's big change is to take the uh, no IR camera out and put a regular camera in. I thought the IR would be fun and be able to look in at night, but it turned out not to be very useful and it really degrades the picture quality. So hopefully get some much better pictures of the little birds this year. All right. So next I have notes from Jose David, who's missing the meeting. And after that, we'll go to Katni. Uh, so last week, uh, Jose updated the base alignment feature for bitmap label, which I am really happy to see, by the way. 
uh, belated hug report. Uh, a PR to solve the label not seeing tab characters in strings, Spanish web light translations, and studying the I2C peripheral. Next week, pull request to solve the tab issue in bitmap label, and update read the docs for the display library after all the changes. Uh, after Ketney, we will go to Kmatch98. All right, so last week we surpassed 300 libraries. Um, we, uh, and I think this was an excellent decision, decided um, a few months ago maybe to start including the community bundle in all of our numbers and, and all of our data, um, which is why the library section uh, covers some extra special stuff, including the bundle. Um, and for the Python on Harbor newsletter, we always include a number, and that was kind of actually what sparked us to start including both, um, was that we decided to start including all of them in that number. And so when I put together that section of the newsletter last week, I noticed that we hit 300 libraries. Um, so that's really exciting. And actually, we're at 302 now. Uh, last week, we hit 300, but um, we had two, uh, both an Adafruit one and a community one merged this weekend, which is excellent to see. So there'll be a blog post about that, and it'll go into the newsletter. Um, the more that you folks help us, the, the more stuff we can do. And the community bundle is, as it sounds, entirely contributed by the community. So that's really amazing. There's, I think, 36 libraries in there. Um, it's not a small thing. It's, it's, not a, it's, it's a significant percentage of the total libraries. Um, so thank you to everybody who's been contributing to the libraries. Thank you to everyone who's been reviewing. Thank you to everyone who's been authoring. And thank you to all of our community bundle contributors uh, for helping us get here. Um, so also last week, I finished up the Pico guide. Um, the getting started with Pico guide, uh, we did um, almost everything we wanted, but there were two things we couldn't do at the time that I'd done the guide. The, the features hadn't been implemented, and one thing we just didn't get to. Um, so that has all of the stuff we want in it now, um, minus a uh, still being updated FAQ slash troubleshooting page. So that will continue to be dynamic, but the guide itself is done. Um, I updated the guide for the MLX 90393. I think because I typo that constantly, a uh, guide for the STEMI QT revision. So the STEMI QT rev is in there now and all the wiring diagrams for the new version and all that stuff are there. Um, added some further documentation to the Feather Can guide. And on Friday, I worked with Anne to start learning how to take over the newsletter. Um, Anne's gonna be out for a bit and Anne does all of the superstar work that makes that newsletter happen. Um, and so I have been asked to uh, take over that while she is away, um, which means over the next few weeks, uh, this will be popping up in my status update um, each week because I'm going to be working with her. Um, so we covered some of the initial steps and a bit about adding content. This week, uh, I already added the PCB files for the PyRTC to GitHub. Um, and uh, worked with Anne on or I'm going to going to be working after this meeting, going to be working with Anne on publishing, on the publishing end of the newsletter, because um, that happens on Mondays, so we couldn't really cover that on, on Fridays. And over the weekend, I forgot to continue these notes. Um, I will finish them when I am done talking. Um, I published a new theme for my website, um, which was a huge undertaking, um, updated to use the latest of things, which uh, there were no examples of um, so it was a matter of, of kind of doing everything from scratch, uh, but it turned out really well and I'm really happy with it. And, um, it's got some excellent features thanks to, uh, Crayola, who I mentioned earlier. And, um, I, uh, I'm really excited about that. So that's been published so I can actually go back to, um, publishing content, uh, because the, the way that the site is generated. Um, I could have worked in a branch on the update, but I didn't, of course, which meant that if I published content, the half working theme would also have been published with it. So I needed to wait until I got it into a working state before I could go back to publishing content. Um, but I've reached that point. 
So I'm very excited about that. And that's my update. And I think that uh, for now you are pausing your hosting of the weekly meetings. Is that right? Yes. Um, I am not going to be hosting any of these. I'll be attending, uh, but I'm not going to be hosting these meetings because um, the newsletter stuff all happens on Mondays, the publishing rather. I'm nodding over here, but you can't see it. Yeah, yeah. The publishing of the newsletter all happens on Monday as it goes out on Tuesday morning. And so when you host this meeting, there's a good hour, hour and a half of extra stuff you do afterwards, um, depending on, you know, how, whether YouTube agrees with you or not, um, that sort of thing. And so that extra time will be huge um, for me to be able to put into the newsletter um, and also to put into working with Anne on learning about the newsletter. So for the next, I want to say something like 10 weeks, um, I will only be attending. I will not be hosting. You will be hearing from Jeff and Scott only. Or if uh, you're sick of hearing from the two of us, we will take volunteers. But uh, yeah, anyway, that's probably too much to hope for. Uh, I'll pass things to KMatch98 and then to Maker Melissa. Okay, thanks, Jeff. So last week, I uh, continued work on these graphical user interface elements and uh, actually submitted a clean pull request for just the widget and control classes. These are structure, or the widget is more about the graphical uh, display, and control is more about how the, the widget should respond to touch events. So that's pull request in place there. Uh, also, a related note is I got Sphinx set up so I could run on my local machine. So that helps iterate a lot more quickly on uh, seeing the changes and debugging the weird commands that Sphinx uses. Uh, and last uh, item from last week is I added some easing functions, they're called, for animating widgets, which make them springy or move in slow and fast, however you like them, different options there. Um, this week, I uh, hope to uh, update the widget and control class documentation. Uh, in particular, I guess related to some other items, is to figure out how Sphinx can make sure all the inherited properties are well documented uh, with the vision that people don't have to hunt through a lot of different layers of documentation to figure out all the features of a, of a given uh, class. Um, next, I want to get uh, my first widget in, in a PR, which is the round switch. Uh, so I need to check that through work with the grid layout function, which helps to speed laying out uh, different widgets on the screen. Uh, and once I check that, I want to get it documented and submit a PR this week. Uh, talk about Sphinx there. Um, also, the latest progress bar uh, has make, been making good progress, so I want to take a look at that uh, latest updates. Uh, and then last, I still on my to-do list, the, uh, the fan fancy bitmap uh, functions need to organize those better so they can fit into the core as an option to build. And then lastly, so other quasi, or let's call it different stuff. Uh, so here in Austin, it's 70 degrees today, which it should be in February, but we went through about a week of sub-freezing weather, so a lot of a lot of work to dig out from that. So I'll be working on plumbing, which is like a lot like software development is playing whack-a-mole. So that's for this week. All right. Uh, after Maker Maker Melissa, I will I believe read some uh, notes from Mark. Go ahead, Melissa. Hello. Uh, so last week I finished writing at the 1.54 inch e ink guide. Uh, I added the from ISO format function to the date time library. Uh, and I updated a project for John Park to use the date time library, which used that function. Um, I did some troubleshooting on I2C, a uh, soft reset issue with uh, CircuitPython and the ESP32S2. And I put some notes in the um, uh, GitHub tickets. Uh, I did, er, I wrote my first e-ink driver for the SSD 1681, which is the new 1.5 inch display. And uh, I started working on getting the e-paper display SSD 1681 driver on the Raspberry Pi to work. This week I'm going to finish getting that working, uh, just like not writing out spy data for something, so I'm setting up a fresh Raspberry Pi. Um, I need to update the e-ink guide uh, for the new Pythonian drivers. Uh, I need to test out a new ST7789 Raspberry Pi display driver um, for doing the frame buffer copy. copy. 
Um, if that works, I'll update the PyTFT scripts to use that driver. I need to update the uh, Gizmo library to test out the SSD 1681 display on there. Um, and if there's time, I'll take a look at adding rotation to the MagTech library. And that's it. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, I have a few sections of notes to read, and then up after that is Scott. So uh, notes from Mark, also known as Gamblor. Uh, taking a look at Count IO on RP2040, I have a question in the weeds about how to read it in the background. Then notes from Microdev, who is also text only today, uh, implemented RP2040 UART and working on merging in MicroPython v1.14. I have got MPY cross-building successfully. Ports are next. And in the notes document, there is a uh, link to the branch itself. So if you're interested, you can take a look there. And um, I think from there, you can probably figure out how to download the code. Anyway, if you have questions about using GitHub in order to check out Microdev's work, we would be happy to help you with that. Uh, next up is Scott and then TG Techie. Awesome, thanks Jeff. Uh, first up for me, I, I have to finish this audio work. Um, I have PDM test code with PIO, uh, but it is like hanging and or crashing, like the USB disappears, so it's no good. Um, but luckily, I'll, J-Link just added support, so I'm hoping today after I get through email and stuff, I'll be able to get some time to use the J-Link on the, on the RP2040 Feather to figure out where uh, things are going haywire with PDM stuff. Uh, and hopefully once I get that uh, fixed, then I'll be able to get PDM in working, so, and then have a pull request for I2S out and PDM in. Uh, the next thing I have to do after that is I need to add a stopgap for flash size configurations uh, per RP2044. Um, it'll be super basic. It'll just be the file system size. It won't handle like uh, how the flash is connected up and what flash chip it actually is. Uh, that'll come later. Uh, but we're starting to, it's starting to see chips hit manufacturers from Raspberry Pi. And so uh, we're going to have more boards for the RP2040 uh, imminently. So getting a stopgap in there is, is critical um, because we don't want to we don't want to do board definitions with the wrong flash size and then upgrade them to a different size later because that would require a file system rewrite so um, that's top of mind and then I want to do get your merged in if uh, microdev hasn't finished it and then also rotary IO I think I want to uh, I have a way I have ideas on how to do all these things I just need to sit down and do them that's why I need to finish this audio work, <laughs> so I can move on to some other stuff. Yeah. That's it for me. Sounds like your plate's pretty full. Always. Good. You should be busy. All right. Busy and employed. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, TG Techie is up next, and then I'll go to the top of the alphabet. Um, I don't think everyone's been up to a, a lot of fun things. Um, so last week, I, thanks to Don H, um, finally got through some sorting on the smart block, which has been months and months in the making. Um, and I ended up dead bugging a, a raw uh, NS280 module and just building it up from scratch and realizing, oh, if I add package crystal, the thing goes away. Because it's because I was configuring it. And um, that was the last known module. Until uh, I fixed this bug. Other people found it as well for me. Um, in the LP79203 driver. Um, in the that down in the weeds, it's just a sort of a similar experience. And uh, I was just looking at the one division to reveal in, in non circuit Python news. Uh, news. And next week, I'll be doing some GG3 work. Surprise. Uh, and trying to wipe the bootloader off of the metronome board, which has been very stubbornly hanging on, which kudos. Um, and uh, hopefully do some work on the rectangle, oh, memory light rectangle for display I.O. Meant to get to it last week, but school got in the way, or school needed to happen temporarily, and uh, 
that's all. Thank you. Uh, moving back to the top of the alphabet, I've got a few people to read, and then uh, Dan will be up after them. So from Ask Patrick W, we have uh, last week they updated CIRCUP to use the requirements.txt released in the bundles, added pre-commit, and made the repo and dev workflow feel like other CircuitPython library repos, and using a Feather S2 and BME680 to monitor my refrigerator. We think the thermostat is off because it is freezing things. And this week, the plan is to start looking at the Azure IoT library work to support sockets. Next, I have notes from C. Grover, who submitted the learning guide for improving the low speed performance of brushed DC motors by adjusting the PWM frequency parameter. It was the result of needing to obtain smoother startup movement of the string car racer and other DC motor based robots. Low speed movement is especially critical for the string car when it's searching for end of string to prevent an acrobatically fatal collision. The guide provides a few practical CircuitPython examples derived from a custom motor testing apparatus that measured P motor PWM frequency response spectrum. The motor kit library was modified to permit adjustment of the PWM frequency as well. After the all too long distraction into DC motors, it's time to take stock and reprioritize the stack of unloft projects unless these two Picos manage to squirm to the top. Oh yeah. After lo I look into submitting a PR to add UV index and Lux getters to the LTR 390 UV sensor library. And unrelated, uh, took on a challenge to illustrate a book of poetry for young adults. I'm not an artist, so this is definitely out of my comfort zone. Lesson learned, hide your doodles. And uh, so that we have Dan next, and then I have weird notes from David. fixed a bunch of things. Uh, there was an issue with the RP2040 PWM out that the peripherals are somewhat peculiar and the top, there's an off by one error that's easy to make. So I fixed that. And now it means that when you say 100% duty cycle on PWM out, it's truly 100% um, and doesn't have a glitch in it every 65,000 counts. I finished uh, the secondary CDC uh, USB serial channel and a bunch of people are trying that, thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned before, I was trying to debug a BLE problem that turned out to be a ULAB problem, and that was fixed by Jeffler and Zoltan. Great. I've been looking at various IPC problems on the RP2040. Uh, the peripheral doesn't allow you to do zero length writes, which is how we do various things, like I scan for devices. And if you look at MicroPython, it uses bitbang IO for that. And um, so I tried to use bitbang IO in the same way, and it turns out there's something wrong with our bitbang IO uh, implementation. And I just trying it by itself, it doesn't work very well when you try to talk to IPC devices. So I've got to debug that. It's probably some timing problem. And there are various other bugs that I'm continuing to add and knock off uh, for 6.2.0. But it's sort of like every day there's one or two new bugs that get added. So we have to decide what's going to go into 6.2.0 at some point. OK, I'm done. All right. I have notes from David. And uh, Deshipo, if you can let me know if you want to try your mic again, uh, that would be helpful. David writes, received my ESP32C3, uh, had some failures with reading from more than one LYWSD03MMC, and adapting and testing Tetris on the U Gamepad 10. And now Deshipu is next, followed by Foamy Guy. Uh, so I was working on uh, improving the display I.O. group so by making it use the Python list uh, internally so that you no longer have to specify the machine size and also so that you can use uh, some of the list uh, methods on it that that's solved. And uh, I have a PR uh, app, but it, it sadly it didn't result in simplification of, of the code. Uh, so I have an in the weeds uh, to further discuss this. All right. Uh, after Fumi Guy, we have Higher Effect. And apologies for the background noise. Uh, my wife was coming in and out the door, and it is a very squeaky door. So if you got that, sorry, it's out of my control. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, uh, go ahead. No worries. Thanks, Joe. Um, for last week, I um, merged the PRs for, there was actually two of them for uh, display text for the base alignment, um, new feature in there that will allow it to line up different labels, uh, especially when they're using different fonts is when this is most helpful. You can align them up along the baseline. That way they look nice uh, next to each other and you don't have to guess and check on pixels anymore. Um, reviewing and testing the uh, the progress bar and uh, display IO layout PRs. So Hugo's doing great work on the progress bar and KMatch on the uh, display IO layout uh, libraries. A couple of good PRs in there. Did some work uh, looking at those and reviewing them. Um, I finally made the leap to learn how to, uh, I'll say, quote unquote, install pre-commit, which is uh, to say, not like put it on my computer, but uh, make it run automatically inside Git. They use the term install uh, for that to, to make it go automatically. So I learned how to hook that up and figure out how to use that. Um, and then uh, last thing for last week is I successfully sent and received some uh, message packed data over LoRa RFM radios. So uh, message pack, new module in the core that just got merged in somewhat recently, a couple weeks back. Um, and I was able to use that to uh, send some uh, like JSON data pretty much uh, across the radios. So that was really cool. Um, for next week, I'm gonna get started on uh, inside the learn system on a new guide that will cover uh, display text. So there's some documentation out there on GitHub, um, but I have to go ahead this past week to move that into a learn guide. So I'm gonna get started moving all that stuff in and uh, getting screenshots and everything together for a real nice uh, comprehensive guide for text. Um, gonna make a PR for linear layout inside display layout. So we have grid layout right now is the, uh, the first one that's in there, uh, but I did have a linear layout from some older work I did. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in this week. Um, I need to go and dig out my, uh, my matrix portal because I wanna do some testing on that with the progress bar uh, PR. There's a new matrix portal example in there I wanna try out. And then uh, last thing for me next week is going to be the uh, last thing that I could think of uh, as of today anyway, uh, was going to be testing out the, uh, the fix for the tabs, the way the tabs are getting uh, taken out of display text labels. So I saw there was a PR out there for a fix for that. So I'm going to look into that this week. And that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next, I will hand a tire effect and then wrap things up with notes from Hugo. Alrighty, um, this past week uh, I hacked a bit at the ice word C problems on the ESP32 S2 um, with a debugger. Um, kind of dug in there enough to make sure that it wasn't something somehow that was trivial that we had missed. Uh, it doesn't seem to be that, it seems pretty hairy. Um, I got some decent test results, but uh, didn't make a whole ton of progress there. Still kind of waiting on us to wrap up all the stuff about upgrading the IDF and stuff to, to hack back into that. Um, my big project uh, this past week was low power on the STM32. Um, that's uh, involved a lot of trying to get various modules out of other modules so that they can be used across modules. Um, so getting pin interrupts, I had to extract the pin interrupts out of pulse in, um, which was the only place they were used earlier, and into their own little separate uh, shareable uh, area so that we can put them into pin alarm. going to have to do the same thing this week with the RTC, uh, which is currently completely implemented in uh, port.c and uh, really needs to be implemented across stuff. Um, but the, uh, the benefit of that is that uh, some of the STM32 modules that were sort of intimidating because they were, were going to require those extractions and all the testing that's required with that. Um, are going to be made a lot easier once low power is done. So putting an RTC or rotary I.O. Uh, is going to be a lot uh, simpler uh, once we get some of those extractions out. So those might be some low-hanging fruit modules to just kind of really quickly bang out um, after the low power stuff is done. So uh, this week I've got uh, pin alarm working. I just need to wrap up time alarm. Um, there's no touch module on the STM32. Yet we would have one if we had the L series of STM32s, but the, the F4, F7, and H7 don't have them, so no touch IO or uh, touch module for low power wake up um, right now. So that's what I've got on the list for this week, and then uh, yeah, we'll just keep thinking about stuff after that. And that's for me. Thanks. I will 
round this out with notes from Hugo, uh, who reports last week got 98% through the progress vertical progress bar updates, fixed issues and suggestions from other PB issues into the current one, and started working on moving PyLint to pre-commit. This week, wrap up progress bar refactor and vertical. Make sure examples still work as expected on devices, not just Blinka on computer ones. Work on cookie cutter to incorporate PyLint, including documentation, documentation of changes to apply to existing libraries. Add support for anchoring in progress bar, and might take a detour from the progress bar and work issues work on issues in other libraries. Uh, and Hugo is open to suggestions and or requests. So that wraps up status updates. Thank you very much. We will now head to in the weeds. Oh, that was interesting. Um, we've already heard from Entol, uh, but now we will go to Hugo's item, which as he's missing it, uh, he invited you to talk about it. Foamy guy, do you feel like doing that? Yeah. yeah All right. Yeah. Um, let me just take a quick read and make sure I know. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Um, so this was in, it, it came up in the progress bar library, but it is, I suppose, a more general uh, question than that. But um, in libraries where it's changing from a single Python file into a package, um, typically we have to go back and change any code that was making use of that library. So like, uh, especially anything inside the learn guide repo, um, or any other examples that might have been making use of that library, we have to go and change the imports. I figured out a way tinkering with it over the weekend where I can put uh, an import into the bottom of initpy in the package, um, and it can make it so that the original import statement, like without the extra dot and the, uh, I guess, module name, I'm not 100% sure on the terminology, uh, but it can make it work with the original import statement without having to change anything. Uh, but what I didn't know is like the rest of the, uh, the implications of that. I didn't know if importing that thing would lead to, you know, I guess probably taking up extra memory sometimes uh, and potentially not getting used by the user. Um, so generally speaking, my question is like, do we do we want to do something like that where we could add imports into a recently broken apart uh, package library to get it to work with the old, uh, you know, importing API or is it better to just kind of, you know, rip the Band-Aid as it were and, um, you know, all the code will have to change and we have the means to go and, and do that, but not worth necessarily trying to add that uh, import into there. So I think generally it is good to have it in init.py for backwards compatibility. I think that mean, I, I the thing that I would check that I'm not positive on is just that if you import the individual modules, it's, it uses less memory. I think that's true only only unless the individual modules then import the top level thing, the, like the init. Um, I see. But I think that's true. Basically, like, I think it's a good idea, assuming that you get backwards compatibility by having the import in init, but you can also use the specific module if you need it. Okay. Um, yep. It does then, work on both. I did see that when I was messing with it. It does work with the new way as well. Okay, so I would assume that the new way would use less memory, and that means that if we find examples that do have trouble because they are they use too much memory, I would just whack them all those as they come up and just okay. move them to the new API, like the module-specific one, as needed, rather than having to like force yourself to find every single one of them up front. Okay, cool. I will make a note on uh, on that progress PR uh, to leave the, uh, the little import that I found there, and we'll plan on putting that inside of init, and then keeping an eye out for um, any reports of memory issues. Awesome! Thank you so much for doing that. I think the only caveat worth including here is um, if there are examples that exist that would benefit from the new structure. Uh, it's probably and... worth updating like not it, obviously leave the code so that it's backwards compatible but let's say there's an example in the guide like specifically with the progress bar that talks about you know expanding you know to different options for progress bar or something like that 
and it ends up being worth updating to use the newer um, package import, um, it's still worth, even though you set up backwards compatibility, it's still worth checking to see what examples exist already and make sure that none of them um, make sense to be updated. Okay, yeah, because it could. I can see how that could add clarity by uh, by doing the new import. It would kind of add a little bit to that. Um, that yeah, so and it, that. in a lot of in a lot of places, it's probably fine just to leave it alone. But you never know, and so it's just worth taking you know the the ten minutes to just you know search through learn and make sure that there's nothing um, that could be useful. Cool. Alrighty, thank you. I appreciate uh, appreciate insight from both of you. Yeah, that's a good point, Kathy. Thank you. Um, and I think that covers it uh, for the Hugo's talk it topic there. All right, thanks. Uh, next, I have a topic from Jose David, who is missing the meeting. Related to a lot of discussions in Discord and the work in the new progress bar, I saw that there's a function to transpose uh, a, an XY tile as a bitmap. I'm wondering if we can apply the same to a character and have vertical text, i.e. for the progress bar or label any insight is appreciated. So I assume this is the transposing code that I added to the core for um, the NeoPixel thing, and it is not directly applicable to display IO bitmaps. Um, Scott, do you have any thoughts about just generally rotation and display IO and how that might work? Uh, it's been so long. Yeah, I know there is an overall display rotation, um, which means that kind of in there we do have the code to to rotate a bitmap, but we can't do them on a one by one or a display group by display group basis. So I'm I'm sure. So the terminal I/O, for instance, is a tile map, so you can rotate tiles in display I/O easily. You the problem can... is you ro rotate the whole thing. Uh, you don't rotate. Uh, if you have a tie, tile grid that has several tiles in it, which is larger than one tile, you rotate the whole tile grid. Uh, but uh, I, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to display it vertically using that. So for a, a traditional text label which uses a bunch of tile grids, then you could you could rotate each tile grid 90 degrees and get vertical text yes. but it wouldn't work yes. for the bitmap font where it writes the pixels of the character no it would because you could rotate that too well, it would it, it would rotate the whole mm -hmm. like text it like rotates that. the whole bitmap so yeah i think it should be possible to make a rotated label of either kind out of the code we have it's just the the one particularly the the one based on multiple tile grids one per character would need to track where the pixel where the the character positions are differently but none of this would directly use that new code it sounds like if we can rotate tile grids that it's all there already uh, and foamy guy writes in the text chat some of the new bitmap manipulation functions that kmatch 98 is working on which i forgot about uh, might be helpful for rotating bitmaps as well. That's true. One of Kmatch 98 item, Kmatch 98's items that he's working on is a general rotation of bitmaps, and that would include 90 degree rotations. So I think there's definitely a number of directions to go, and so I hope that uh, Jose will try some out and report back on what works or what doesn't work. Um, and so now I've got another. In the weeds to read and this one is from Mark uh, who says I looked at count IO for RP 2040 the PWM counter wraps at 65536 so unless the user is actively reading it it would be very easy to wrap and have no indication my thought is to use a background process in port background to just read slash update this if it's active just making sure that sounds correct um, my gut is that that's certainly one way to do it. You should be able to make your background task run frequently, but I don't know, to call port background, you probably have to have ticks turned on, otherwise it's not gonna necessarily call it. Um, and of course, tracking the 
overflow from an interrupt handler is another way that uh, is kind of more resistant to stuff that's going on in the foreground of CircuitPython. Um, so I think that would be the better way, just totally off the top of my head without knowing more about how exactly the PWM works. So there the idea would be you would create an interrupt handler for the overflow and do the thing there rather than doing it in port background. You, and you were saying something, Scott? Uh, you're right. I would do interrupts. Okay. Yeah. We don't have anything against doing interrupts in, in this core C code. That's okay. totally fine. We do it everywhere. It is a little weird on the RP2040 because the Pico SDK has their own interrupt APIs. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason they have that is because they try to manage the like multi-core part of it. Um, but I think I do have examples in some of the other peripherals where I've done interrupts. I just kind of do it myself because it's more, it's more similar for me to just do it myself because I've done it before on an Acortex M0 before. Right. For those of you who have like, like the, the way that interrupts work on the RP2040 is that like, there are wires connected from peripherals to what's called a, the NVIC, the nested vector interrupt controller. And like usually on like a SAMD21, you have one of those for the core. Um, but the weirdness with um, the RP2040 is that it actually has two NVICs, one for each core. Um, and so if you're not careful, you can end up enabling like running code based on the interrupt in two places. Um, and so that's why they have different stuff. But since CircuitPython is single core right now, like I just kind of do it directly. But happy to help with that if Mark needs more pointers on interrupts. And when when you say you did it directly, are you saying that's a fine way to do it? Do it whichever way you're more comfortable with, or would it be better to do it your way, or better to follow the SDK as someone arriving at it fresh? I think either way is fine. Um, I think using the SDK is fine if, if you read the APIs and it looks okay. It's just that, like, I've poked the registers on an NVIC before, so what I want to be able to do is actually, like, control it directly from there. So that's what I've done. It's, like, just, like, auto, like directly writing the registers of the, of the NVIC. Um, so, yeah. I think either way is fine. Um, but I just kind of, like, I like to do it myself. All right, uh, next we have an item from TG Techie. Um, um, this is a bit of a library in the week, not a boy. Um, there's, I believe, a long running bug, as mentioned before, in the LC709203 Elf driver chip that the uh, battery data charge chip, data suit, has on the new ish breakout board. Um, where it will frequently respond to a request for RSPC with a CSE error. Um, and what's actually happening under the hood is the chip isn't responding at all. If you clear the, um, in the library, if you clear the write buffer before reading and writing, you'll see that the, it doesn't change. Very quickly, you know, with, with the library's menu, manually manipulating it all. And um, I know the talk does use talk. Section. I was curious if anyone's had similar issues where chips should be responding and it does sometimes, but not always. Um, is that a common thing people see? I squared C devices vary a lot uh, in okay. to how responsive they are. I think you're, you're on NRF, right? Like you're doing it from an NRF? Yes. Um, I would. Multiple chips. So it's not just one unit of LC and multiple RCs. And how 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 do they have different addresses? Sorry, uh, not on the same bus. So okay. I've tried it with multiple versions. See if it's like I broke this specific overheated that one. Right. Uh, I, I know I know for a fact that like having a logic analyzer makes all of this like much. I, I, I can't do it without a logic analyzer simply because then I know I can determine what's on the wire. So I know like source of truth or what like I should be seeing from the inside. Um, but generally it's just like problems like this come from just not reading. Like either the data sheet has something that tells you like don't do this more than this often or like 
um, or they don't, and but you, that's still true. <laughs> um, so it's probably just a quirk of the chip. Like the chips have to, like I, I, being an I squared C peripheral is actually non-trivial, right? Because you don't know what is going to happen until you get the data, and then like you don't have any responsibility or or. In, in I squared C, you only have clock stretching to basically like wait, say, like to say wait back to the, to the main, um, the main part of the I squared C. So, I squared C peripheral is, is pretty tough. Um, so y there, you might find that there's timing requirements in the data sheet that just like aren't being enforced. That should be. On the, oh, I'm on the I'm a bit surprised here because uh, you if you are getting all the that means that the chip is still acting every mm. every response. It's not like SPI where you where you just pull the pin down it just reading zero. I two C requires cooperation. So mm -hmm. apparently the, the peripheral is still working on that other side. It just has no data since I mean mm -hmm. strange. Well, yeah, the other thing that occurred to me is generally there are pull-ups. So if your device stops doing something that it should have been doing, then the, the bus is going to end up in a high value state and C1 is not a low value state and C0s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is why I was not just a standard, oh, you can't pull it. And um, why I'm doing this here. Look at the timing and that on the data sheet. Um, I'm also curious if anyone has one of these and look at M M4 or M0 and are willing to run some tests uh, if I, when I, uh, have done a little more research given what you've presented here. The other thing I remember about this chip, assuming that we're talking about the same one, is um, at one point I was going to look at it and I was admonished to make sure I had a battery hooked up and that if there wasn't a battery hooked up it would malfunction. So I don't know whether you have a battery attached or not, but definitely attach one and see if that changes the behavior if it's not there now. Uh, it is. It, it definitely does. Actually. Okay. You're welcome. And for the last item, uh, I will pass it to Dishapu. Okay, so uh, I, as I mentioned, I tried to work on this uh, display I.O. group thing, and the initial idea was to make it inherit from a list, so that the groups are practically lists with some extra functionality in them. That would be nice for uh, two reasons. One is that uh, you get all of those methods for free, basically. And the second one is that you save a lot of space because you don't have to have all those wrappers, all, all these parameter par parsing thing and so on. That could actually uh, shrink the code we have in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem I had with that is that uh, there, the, it seems that uh, not all, but some of the code in, in Circuit Python assumes that a C class is the last class mm -hmm. it uh, inherits from. So there is this uh, sub object uh, uh, member on the instance, and there is a lot of code that always uh, returns just sub object zero uh, instead mm -hmm. of, of the uh, proper index for the type that it got. Uh, so there is this quiet assumption that uh, it's always like the top class from the inheritance uh, hierarchy. The, I wonder if there are, uh, if we want to work on this to make it possible to have more than one class in the hierarchy, uh, one than more uh, C class in, in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I'm just not sure if it's, uh, if it's worth it. Yeah, I mean, I, when I recommended you doing it th that way, I knew that was something of like, I'm not sure it's possible or, or supported. Um, I mean, if you're digging in the pipe folder and doing that, 
it's always good to check to see if MicroPython's changed it. Um, it would, I think it would be nice to have, but it's a, I, it, it's gonna be a kind of a lot of work, I think, so. Yeah, yeah, well, maybe not even a lot of work, but pretty easy to make a mistake in there. Right. That affects the whole, whole runtime. Yeah, I mean, the, the unit tests we inherited from MicroPython are pretty good, so I, I wouldn't worry a ton about breaking um, something in the, in, the, in the VM itself because of those tests, but um, if you don't want to do that, it's totally fine if you just want to have a, a list object inside the group instead of being a subclass of it. You'll have to re like redirect some of the function calls you want to. Yeah, expose. yeah, that, that's what I did in the in the end. But uh, the the type of thing is that makes it uh, larger than it was with uh, its own dedicated code. So this so reusing the yeah. list code makes it larger. Yeah. Which is yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you mean code-wise? Yeah, I mean the binary is larger. Right. Yeah, yeah, I... I don't have a good answer. <laughs> so, a thing that I've seen the core doing, um, there are, for instance, when you think about things that store collections of bytes or characters, there are a bunch of types that are really similar. There's string, there's binary, there's... Uh, array and so they pull this trick where they're distinct types with no other base type but they have the same structure layout at least for the initial fields and then you can put the same methods in the methods of your object um, right i i was also wondering about using this trick for all the layer layer objects Mm -hmm. Because a lot of uh, code right now is uh, the code that uh, checks what type a particular layer is and then uh, calls the proper uh, method on it. And a lot of those methods are just identical, just take different types. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if we make the struct so that all the shared fields are at the beginning of the struct, we could just uh, cast them at least for, for those common operations, we could mm -hmm. cast them to the base uh, right. track type and, and not care about checking. Yeah, although I was thinking about that as a way to allow group to have, a, to have the behaviors of a list, and so that would complicate letting a group and a tile grid, then you couldn't make those have the same initial fields, so you could pick yeah, one yeah, or the I, other but I not both. I think um, we have more to win doing this with layers than doing this with group and list. And of course, the other way to kind of get rid of those, if it's this type, do this, and if it's that type, do that, are protocols, which are tables of function pointers. Um, and we use that in audio samples, and then it's also used in the core, like for um, file I.O., I think? So that's another way, if you want to, to unify this code that's checking for yeah, different types of layers, as you call them, uh, would be to yeah, adapt so it to use most, protocols. Most of those are just setting a particular flag or something mm. like that. A very, very small function. It's just uh, the fact that this flag is in different place in each of yeah. those objects. Yeah, it would be nice if that could be regularized. It might save some real some some important amounts of code, I guess. The other thing that concerned me about um, the the list thing is you would need to intercept any call that actually changed the list. So, like the subscript assign, you would have to do the do the thing and then potentially redraw your screen. So you can't only do the the list operation you have to do the list operation and then do something else and i'm sure you're aware of that but that also complicates kind of yeah, the yeah. using a subclass we, need, we still need some wrapper but only on some methods yeah not on all of them and uh, that's why also i can i cannot just uh, expose the list to the user mm -hmm. right. yes i agree with that's that an attribute because that that would be uh, also, some solution, but then we miss the uh, updates. Right. 
I think it sounds like you have a, a good grasp of this, and it sounds like you did the like nested list sort of thing, and then and that's just the, the cost of it. I think adding a bit of size to it is not the end of the world. Well, it depends on all those nearly full ports, but we can often yeah, find a little storage to get back. Right now, we we only uh, the only one is failing is the French translation on the QT uh, Express. Mm -hmm. Express thing, and that's 72 bytes. I'm not mm -hmm. sure what to do with this. I tried to this trick with the inline limit, but it doesn't seem to work. I, I, I can take a look at that too. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if it's if it's that close, I think it, it would be great to just corrupt. yeah wrap corrupt that one up. Zero and to corrupt DC equals zero. Yeah, yeah. I uh, so basically I copied the the special case for German and applied it to French as well. But, uh, yeah. yeah, it didn't change anything. Maybe I got the language code wrong. Okay, well I'll look at your I'll look at your. Um, is it pushed to your repo? Yeah, it's it's a PR. In the, in the, it's All right, the, All right I'll, look at, I'll, I'll look at I can I can look at those. And I've been trying to um, decrease the number of special cases for various languages, like. I just make the whole build smaller, and then we don't have to do that, do a fresh build thing and all that. Mm -hmm. So, right. and it makes it consistent across all languages. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I noticed that the most problematic language is always the one that has most written translation. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it is interesting okay. that it does it does change over time. Well, to get off on a slight tangent, I think, you know, as you transition from a purely English uh, set of messages to a partially translated one to a fully translated one, there's like mm -hmm. this change in frequency. And so mm -hmm. the effectiveness of the compression can change. And also the translated messages, I feel like they're typically more verbose than English. And I don't understand why that is, but it seems to be the case. All right. Sounds like we have a direction on that, and it'll be nice to see this work done. So thank you for working on it. But if that's it, I will uh, step ahead and do wrap up. So this has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for March 22nd, 2021. And uh, thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us who work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. Did I say March? Well, I was thinking about March. Um, anyway, the video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held next Monday, uh, which is March 1st, I think, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. And just a warning that uh, in just a couple of weeks, the U.S. switches to their summer or daylight saving time. So um, uh, check out the online calendar for notification about that. And apologies for saying March 22nd. I meant February 22nd, but I just looked at the calendar to verify that the next meeting was in March. So stop. Stop laughing at me. Uh, anyway, this meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about this meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.